Hey guys, I want to talk today about heat and what heat really is is the mechanism that we use to take energy from outside of the system and transfer it into the system. And there are three main ways that we can use to transfer energy from outside of the system into the system. Those are the three mechanisms of heat transfer and you're familiar with all of these. They're conduction, convection, and radiation. Right? Conduction is that molecule to molecule transfer of materials through uh, the material to get heat from one place to another. Convection is the transfer of energy by the wholesale movement of materials carrying that energy from one place to another. And of course, radiation is the transfer of energy into or even out of a system uh, as it's carried by electromagnetic waves like microwaves or sort of something along those lines. Uh, anyway, for our purposes here today, it doesn't matter which of these mechanisms we use to transfer the energy. What I want to do is take a look at what happens when we transfer that energy into a system and how we go about calculating the effects of that energy on the system that we've dumped it into. So what do we need to know in order to do that? Regardless of the mechanism of energy transfer that we use, induction, convection, or radiation, we symbolize the heat that's transferred into or out of the system by using the letter Q. So Q is the, uh, the symbol that we're going to use. Q's got a number of different units that we can use to measure it. Sometimes you'll see Q is measured in calories or kilocalories. We're going to use the, uh, the most familiar physics measurement here, which is joules that we're going to use to measure the amount of Q. But what we need to kind of remember is that Q is a transfer of energy. It's like taking a big bucket of Q right here, dumping it into a system, and then changing the state of the system. In this case, if we're adding Q to the system from our bucket, we're going to see probably the temperature going up, although as we investigate what happens on a real system, uh, we'll see that that's not the only thing that Q can do. So to take a look at the effect of this on a real system, I've got a couple of, uh, couple of things set up. Hang on for one second. We've got a, just a beaker full of the ice cubes from the uh, freezer in the back room, and I keep that freezer set at a pretty low temperature. That freezer set at around 10 degrees below zero Celsius. And so when I put the thermometer in here, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but that shows up at uh, 10 degrees below zero. And uh, that's actually at about eight degrees below zero right now. So it's been sitting out here at room temperature for a little bit. So it, we've actually been transferring energy from the room in there, hitting it with some cues uh, from the room and increasing the temperature. What I'm gonna do with this is put it on the hot plate that I have set up behind the camera. And we'll watch the effect of that transfer of energy via the hot plate, in this case probably conduction, um, and see what effect that has on the system. So let me put this on the, on the plate. And while that's going through its uh, first little sets of input, I want to I wanna show you this diagram. This is a pretty familiar diagram to a lot of you. You may have seen this in chemistry before, if you've studied this in chemistry before. But what we're going to do is take a look at the temperature right here of our system on the on the y-axis and what happens as we add heat to that system here. So we started out with ice cubes that came out of the freezer at negative 10 degrees Celsius. And so I'm going to start us out right here at negative 10 degrees Celsius. And we've already seen a little bit that it's starting to, as we're adding heat to it from outside uh, of that system, that the temperature is starting to rise. And so as we add the heat to the system, the temperature starts to go up. And if I take a look at it now, let me go grab it off the, off the plate. I've got it set up right here where the, uh, the temperature has increased. And at this point, it's actually just a mixture of water and the ice cubes in here together. And they're sitting there at zero degrees Celsius. Now, let me set that down for a minute. So we've seen that the temperature has gone up from negative 10 all the way up to zero degrees Celsius. Now, you guys are, know that this is the melting point and the only point at which both water and ice can coexist, at least here at, uh, at, at sea level or something close to sea level. But there's something that's really interesting that happens as we, as we look at the thermometer through this system. So that temperature is going to stay at zero until all of the ice is melted. So let's think about why that might be. As we continue to add heat, because I haven't taken it off the hot plate or or even as we had it on the hot plate and we continually to add temperature to it, once a little bit of water showed up there, once it got to that melting point, that temperature stays at zero until all of the ice has been converted into water. And so we get a little plateau here on this graph. 
where we're adding energy, but we're not affecting any temperature change as a result of that. And the reason for this has to do with the intermolecular forces that exist between the particles when it's in the ice state. When a material is a solid, there are little bonds between the particles, little intermolecular forces. And, uh, you know, the particles are all moving around, they're shuffling and they're shaking, and I, I may have given you guys this analogy before. I kind of think of the particles that are in a solid material as kind of like rugby players, right? They're all kind of built in tight together, and there's not a lot of degrees of freedom from motion because everybody's all interlocked with the other one, and the whole thing can move a little bit, and everyone's got a little bit of freedom of motion. But nobody can really go fly in any place, uh, in any place too crazy. They can't, they can't get out of that little scrum that we have going on right there. When we take them from that solid state into the next state, into that liquid state, when we go from ice into water, what we're doing is we're breaking up that rugby scrum, and we're breaking those intermolecular forces uh, that, that exist there, and we're giving the players a lot more degrees of freedom, and suddenly that game of rugby, which is all tightened up, starts to look like a game of hockey, right, where the players are zipping all over the ice, and they can move really fast in this direction, they can't be contained, and it's just happening in all kinds of directions and at all kinds of speeds, and there's a lot more degrees of freedom, and that really characterizes the molecules that exist in, or the, at least the state of the energy state of the molecules as they exist in a liquid. But something has to happen. We need to break those bonds that exist between those two states in order to set the players free, set those molecules free. And that's really what we're doing right here with that energy. So what I want to do is back up a little bit and take a look at what we're doing with our Q that we're putting into the system here versus what we're doing with our Q when we put it into the system here. Okay? So when we're going through our temperature change phase, We're using our Q to change the temperature, obviously, and we characterize the Q, we, we quantify the Q that we're throwing at the system by using the equation Q is equal to mc times delta T, okay? So let's think about what each of these individual particles are. Q, obviously, is our heat that's going in. It could be in the form of microwave radiation. It could be in the form, in this case, of of, con of uh, conduction or convection, it doesn't really matter, it's our heat that's going in. M stands for mass, and delta T is our change of temperature. Now there's one more piece of this, and you may have heard about this in chemistry, and it's this guy right here, C. C refers to the specific heat. And the specific heat is really characteristic of any different type of material. And what it really kind of is, is, is the thermal inertia. It's a measurement of how difficult it is to change the temperature of something. So if we jump in here and take a closer look at the equation, if I have a given mass with a certain amount of thermal inertia, for every little bit of temperature change I want to get from it, I need to use a certain amount of heat. If I've got a finite amount of heat, I can get a finite amount of change of temperature, okay? Now, obviously that heat is going to go a lot farther over a small volume. I can use a little bit of heat to change the temperature of a cup of tea because that has relatively little mass. If I use the same bucket of cues and I dump that bucket of cues into a bathtub, or even better yet, I take that bucket of cues and I dump it into a lake or even the ocean, I'm going to get very little delta T in response because the mass that I'm dealing with is so large. But we always have to remember that the specific heat of the material, that, that the higher values of specific heat make it much, much harder to change that temperature. They make that heat much less effective in actually accomplishing any real delta T right there. So when we come back to our graph right here, we have in here a Q is equal to MC delta T phase. As we bring that temperature up from negative 10 to 0, we're using a certain amount of heat from here to here on our graph, on the amount of mass that we have in the beaker right here, uh, with the specific heat of water, you can look up specific heats in tables in your book and on the interwebs, they're all over the place, it's not hard to find that stuff, you just simply look it up, uh, to achieve that change of temperature, in this case of positive 10 degrees. Okay. Now, I'm going to put this back onto the, uh, onto the hot plate so that we can continue raising the temperature and we'll see what happens as we go.
So coming back here, looking at the heat that we use during this phase. Obviously, we can't use the equation Q is equal to MC delta T, because even though we're using Q, we're not getting any delta T out of the deal. So if there's no delta T, it indicates there's no Q, but we're using the Q for something else. So let's take a look at that. During this phase change, not temperature change, but a phase change. During the phase change, we're using the, the, the heat, as I said before, to, 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 to break apart those bonds between the different materials. Uh, so when we, when we look at the equation that we're going to use, we're going to use an equation Q is equal to M times L. Now, Q is exactly the same as it was before. This still stands for heat, and M still stands for mass, because we haven't really gained or lost any of our molecules through this process right here. Now, L, L functions in a way that's a little bit similar to the specific heat. It's something that varies as a function of what the material is. Every material has a different value of L. What L stands for is the latent The latent heat. And in this case, when we're going from the solid phase into the liquid phase, we're talking about the latent heat of fusion. And what that really is, is a measurement of how hard that Q needs to work to break the bonds. And depending on how tight those bonds are between the molecules in a solid of a different material, you're going to need more energy to break some and less energy to break others. And that's what L really gives us. So the larger values that we have for L, the harder it is to break those bonds. We're going to need to use more Q, more energy. We're going to have to throw more radiation, keep it in the microwave for longer. We're going to have to turn the burner on the stove up even higher in order to get that mass to go from uh, one side of our plateau all the way over to the other side of that plateau. But this area right in here is where we're spending our Q currency to break the bonds and to go through that phase change. Okay? Now, once we get it through that phase change, what we end up with is obviously a cup full of water. And as we continue to leave it on that hot plate, the temperature of that water is going to increase. You've all made hot water on a stove. So what we see happening here is that the temperature is really going to go up and up and up and up and up, all the way up until it gets to the boiling point. In this case, the boiling point for water is going to be at 100 degrees C. And it looks to me like we're almost there. Let me take a quick look at our temperature right here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see at this point we're right there at 100 degrees. And I don't know if the camera's picking it up right there, but you can actually start to see that there's a lot of steam that's coming off of the top of this right here. And I'm looking at this. It's at 100 degrees, uh, which, is, which is where we've raised it to on the boiling point. But another interesting thing is going to happen here. If you think back to our game of rugby that we turned into a game of hockey to give the players a lot more degrees of freedom, when we go up into the next phase, we've got to give our players more degrees of freedom right there. So and think about the different sports that we have, the analogy that I've always used for this, or maybe not always, but at least since the movie started coming out, coming out is when the molecules go from that liquid phase into the vapor phase, it's like going from a bunch of hockey players who move really fast in lots of different directions and have a lot of freedom, but it doesn't compare to Quidditch, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to use some of our energy at this point not to continue to raise the temperature, not to give us water at 110, 120, 130 degrees. We're going to use our energy for a little while so that we can take those hockey players and we can stick them with brooms and send them flying up into the air, okay? So we're going to have another little plateau phase where we're spending our Q on that. So right here at 100 degrees C, we're going to enter another one of these latent heat phases where we're using our energy to break bonds of a sort. Okay, so we've come through here, we've gone through a second Q is equal to MC delta T phase, and then we're going to get up here and we're going to get another Q is equal to ML phase, where L in this case same exact formula that we're using before is the latent heat of vaporization. Okay, and the latent heat of vaporization is the latent heat that's in there that we need to be concerned about when we're going from the liquid phase into the vapor phase. Okay, but this is what we're using our energy on here. And then, of course, once we've converted everything from our 
boiling water from our water at 100 degrees C to steam to, to, to water vapor at 100 degrees C, we're then going to be able to take that water vapor and start superheating that, right? If we continue to, to keep that enclosed in the system without letting it escape up into the atmosphere, if we keep it enclosed and continue to throw heat at it, we're going to come back to our diagram and be able to get the temperature going on that all the way up to the point where it becomes plasma. And, you know, we're not doing that with water at any, any time soon. So anyway, there's a quick look at what we're looking at when we start dumping our bucket of cues into this system. Hope that helps. Talk to you.